but there were dark rumors that their success came at a terrible price. My dad he was a broken man. He never found peace. The role as manager, Tam Payton, was not the champion and protector he appeared. Tam told us that if one of us slept with this guy, we would probably get much better promotion. Back in the 70s, there were just people that just thought they had the right to do what they wanted with you. It's a story that brought back memories from that time of traumas of my own. I think all the time about, why didn't we say anything? I want to celebrate the achievement of the rollers. But I also want to explore how their dreams of teenage stardom were tainted. I'm on my way home to the city where I was born. See ya. I get so excited every time I go back to Edinburgh. I think of my amazing family, school, good and bad. It's an incredible place to grow up. Everything stems from there. How you doing? And I go around Edinburgh now, and you know you have lots of memories that flash through your mind. And at the heart of it all was the manager, Tam Payton, the pop Svengali who created the band's clean-cut image and picked its lineup. As far as anybody was concerned, they used to be in bed by nine o'clock. They were milk drinkers, dressed up in tartan, and it worked. Everywhere, teenage girls would go crazy. When I joined Radio One, I, I met two Beatles. All the Rolling Stones, Elton, Bowie, but I've never met a roller. I am meeting Stuart Woody Wood. I'm actually ridiculously excited about it. There he is. How you doing? Come here. How are you doing? Oh. And the, the jacket is a superb touch. Oh, I had to be done. Had Look, we've got a nice match going on here. I certainly do, yeah. What's in this case here? Oh, I don't know. I've not looked in it for about 20 years. <laughs> that one, you almost had to do that. This is opening a box of pop history. Unbelievable. Nice. What is that? That was it's a cat suit with tartan on it. So do you wear this on stage? Yeah, yeah. This should be in a bloody museum, not in a suitcase. <laughs> you love these. Look at the size of it. You what size are they? Deal. They were a 24. Oh, 24 that's no ways. use. I'm just slightly more than a 24. There's more. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, it's a tartan. Komodo. Sorry, this is my selfie with you. You go for it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Round and round. Oh. Lovely. 70, is what we like. Yeah. <laughs> So you lived in Marchmont? Yeah. What, one of the tenements, or...? Yeah, we were the third floor up. There was three kids in the family, my mum and dad. Back then, you kind of felt you had to join a gang. There was a lot of fight back then. And I joined Tollcross Rebels. You kind of scratched on your wrist with a pin until it bled. So if I got stopped, I said, no, I'm a TCR, it's, it's fine. I said, ah, he's fine, right. and I'd go find somebody else to kick in that night. <laughs> Playing music, it was just a way to get away from that life. So you were how old when you joined the Rollers? I was just turned 16. I was actually roading for the band at the time. So I got to meet Tam, and then Tam one day had asked me, uh, one of the guys is leaving, would you like to join the Bass City Rollers? And, um, let me think about that. I. Yeah, 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 <laughs> it's like yeah, yeah. amazing. Tam Payton. What was his genius? He was brilliant at publicity. Any, any opportunity, he would grab that and turn it into something. He never missed a trick, that man. 
So what about the control that uh, Tam Payton exerted? Tam was just very domineering, very much the band leader. He was the sixth roller on the road. He was just a big kind of bully type of person. You were a bit... He was a big, strong guy. Was, oh, yeah, back then he was. He was more like a sergeant major. You know, he hated him because we couldn't do anything. But what's the point of dwelling on something that happened that you maybe didn't like? If it's something I don't like, I just put it in a room, lock it, seal it up and throw the key away. And I like to look on a brighter side of things rather than a negative. Meeting Woody has been a thrill, but I am intrigued by his picture of life in the rollers. Hey. Hiya. How you doing? Good. Are you staying in Edinburgh? Yeah. Oh, jealous. Do you know anything about the rollers? <laughs> no. I don't think many people my age do you know who they are. I should look them up, shouldn't I? Yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> Got their bellies out, maybe a bit androgynous. The mania was mad. You see the appeal? Yeah, definitely. Do you want a cup of tea? Yes, please. <clears throat> Just a drop of milk. Mm-hmm. A glass of milk. That's what they used to drink, to make yeah. them seem pure and innocent. That's so weird. <laughs> it's really unsettling. I remember vividly the rollers' innocent image when they first exploded onto the scene. But as the years have gone by, stories have started to emerge that Tam Payton's controlling style had a darker purpose. The former Bay City Rollers manager, Tam Payton, has been arrested by police investigating allegations of sex abuse against young boys in the 70s. In a decade which spawned Gary Glitter and Jimmy Savile, I want to explore the sinister stories that surround the Rollers' manager. I'm going back to the tough working-class Edinburgh of the 1960s, where the Bay City Rollers started out. The band moved from the city's music circuit to performing gigs in small venues across Scotland. Early on, they attracted the attention of ambitious manager Tam Payton, who devoted himself to building the band's following among teenage girls. Nobby Clark was their first lead singer. What were your initial impressions of Tom Payton? He was a big fella, big guy. He had been in the army and he dressed really well. He was kind of like medallion man. Shirts open down to here and the hairy chest that he had mm -hmm. showing and all that stuff. What about the discipline that he exerted over the band? What was that like? I mean, to begin with, it was just we shouldn't have girlfriends because girlfriends with friends would be a distraction. But it got, uh, it got very severe. Tam had to know exactly where you were at any time. You know, at any time. We were playing his game. Before Peyton operated in the music industry, his occupation was as a potato merchant. With the rollers, they were always late. That the hold up was Tam because he was out doing the tatty run, delivering potatoes. But he was determined to get up that stardom ladder. I became a manager, uh, maybe because secretly I'm an egotistical person. Peyton signed the band to Bell Records, who brought in Jonathan King to produce their first single, Keep On Dancing. After it was released, we were invited to meet this guy called Chris Denning. From a Radio 1 DJ? Absolutely. He would get records played on BBC, and, and he knew all the producers and all that stuff. Tam told us that if one of us, or more than one of us, slept with Chris Denning, we would probably get much better promotion. Uh, I remember looking at Alan and he said to me, well, it won't be me. And I said, well, it definitely won't be me. I think its highest position was number nine. That might have been a hit, but you know, at what cost? I realised that 
The Bay City Rollers were about Tam Payton. He didn't care about the band, as far as he was concerned. The Bay City Rollers were to make Tam Payton famous. I grew to despise him in the end. When you hear stuff like that, you kind of think, well, that is repulsive. That's absolutely disgusting. You're a teenager in pop, and you've got to sleep with an old man so that your record does well. If you want to get on, if you want to get some favor, you've got to sleep with him. You know, deal with it. That's the way of the world. Some of those around Radio 1 took advantage of their positions of power. Chris Denning was later imprisoned for abusing underage boys. Jonathan King was also convicted for child sexual abuse. But at the time, their connections in the pop world were invaluable. In the 70s, 24 million people a week listened to Radio 1. Every teenager in the land was glued to it. The Tony Blackburn Show. That's exactly what you're listening to right now. 247 Radio 1. Radio 1 was enormously powerful in those days. Everybody listened to Radio 1. So, yeah, we could make hit records. Radio 1. Gold Show. You're listening to Radio 1 on our fun day out from Mallory Park. In May 1975, Tam Payton masterminded his most successful Rollers promotion yet, guaranteed to grab the headlines. Tam was great at creating publicity. Any kind of publicity was good as far as Tam was concerned. The whole idea of it was we'd arrive and the boat would take us to this wee island. Go to the island, go and do a little interview, fly back to the gig. And amongst all that, there was a bit of mayhem. <laughs> we really must make an appeal to the fans to keep away from the racetrack. Rollers fans are all over the place now. And the Rollers were going across to the island by boat. They got part way across, and then the fans all started taking to the water, which I don't think anybody expected. I was with uh, a Womble in a speedboat for some unexplainable reason. We were trying to rescue these kids, trying to get them back to the shore. Some fans were trying to get on the boat and get into the boat. And the boat's kind of rocking. Tam half went in and Les, he was going in. Quite a lot of excitement. It was just a normal day for us. Right now, we go to the number one sound on top of the pops. What do you know? One of the most popular groups in the country right now. The same year, Bye Bye Baby became their first number one, topping the charts for six weeks. The Rollers embarked on a two-month tour of Britain, causing levels of excitement not seen since the Beatles. Tam Payton had created a phenomenon that gave him huge power. Roller mania. Being a fan of the bass to Rollers, the hysteria just, you got swept along with it. I've never forgotten my first concert. Absolute chaos. Nobody's sat in their seat. Nobody's listening to the music. The guys were there in the flesh in front of you. The fans would be just going bananas. Nine times out of 10, you just felt this big weight on your back. And it was some fan that had got up on stage and she's clinging on to your life. Styling himself as the sixth roller, Peyton often went on stage to take control. Move back nice and quiet, right?
We have to meet a guy called Gert Magnus, and he's part of the whole extraordinary Bay City Rovers story. But Gert has never spoken about any of this on camera before. Hey, Gert, how you doing? Hello. Nicky, nice to meet you. So how did you first meet Tam Payton? When I was about 15 years old, I was in a very big band in Denmark. We played support for Bay City Rollers. After the concert, Tam said to me, I want you to become a Bay City Roller. He said that to yes, you? Yes, yes. It was like a dream for me. I just say, yeah. Oh, look how young you are. Yeah. I live in Tim's house. He buys things for me, a trampoline and pinball machine. He said that I should practice roller songs. You must have thought, yeah, yeah. my time is coming. Yes, of course. It was like this about two years. And then uh, one day we came to London. The two of you? And yeah, that day he said, uh, could you come to me, with me to the room? He wanted to have sex with you, wasn't Yeah. And it was quite clear what he meant. Yes. And I say, no way, Tim. No way. And then he really got angry and he say, you are nothing and I've done everything for you, and I was very proud. You think if you had gone with Tam, you would have become a Bay City Roller? Yeah. I'm completely sure. In March 1975, Tam Payton had bought a house called Little Kelliston, just outside Edinburgh, where Gert and other would-be pop stars spent time. It was fast becoming notorious for its music industry parties. There was always party, lots of young boys, lots of producers and celebrities. Knowing people. Yeah, and, famous people. Yeah. Going to the room and coming out and, you know, big party. So some of these famous people would disappear with the young boys into rooms. Yeah. Having sex. Yes. Can you remember anyone? Jimmy Savile and... You Savile was there, was he? Yeah, right. Did you not think, this is a bit horrible? Of course. But I was uh, so young. You know, I think, oh, that's normal in this business here. That's the music business? Yeah. These stories about the rollers have coincided with some deeply personal things that were happening to my friends and me at the same time in the same city. Since I started trying to tell this story and make this film, lots of stuff has emerged about my own school, the private school I went to. At the school, the Edinburgh Academy, abuse was rife. Loads of us suffered sexual abuse and physical abuse, but there was one particular predator who abused dozens and dozens of boys. It's only when you talk about it that you realise how much it has haunted you. It's another example of somebody in a position of power exploiting vulnerable people, whether exploiting little boys who are at a posh school or whether they're exploiting working-class guys who want to be pop stars. It's the same. The people who are meant to be looking after us were doing that to us. As manager of the Rollers, Tam Payton's predatory nature was becoming more extreme. But did this directly affect any of the band themselves? There were so many dark stories, dark rumours about Tam Payton, and there always have been. But 
This man is seen still by many, despite everything, as a brilliant promoter, marketing man. He made it happen. Tam Payton was working the roller's publicity machine to breaking point. He hastily arranged a TV show to cash in. The telly show, the way we recorded it, there was no run through. I remember having to do a scene with a skiffle board. <laughs> Just talk about it. Right, rolling. That caused, and you signed in uh, 1956. <laughs> So, I think it was called Skiffle. That's right. Three, four. You get this board and you, you, brrr, you know, that, that was it. Right, that's a take, moving on. <laughs> what? Tam's relentless schedule was piling pressure on the young stars. Woody collapsed on stage. Eric was hospitalized after an overdose and the strain was starting to show most seriously on frontman Les. Their concert in Coulston Hall, Bristol's night has had to be cancelled. Uh, Les, Les had an accident driving his new car, in which a woman died. Forced back on stage just days later, he knocked over a photographer at a gig and was accused of firing an air rifle at a fan outside his house. It was very, very tightly managed, and I think that's where the tension started to creep in. And that was the start of him kind of unravelling. Les's breakdown was happening in the media spotlight, but his full story would remain secret for decades. Do you ever get fed up with the adulation? No, I, that's what I wanted. And I've got it. <laughs> September 75. The Rollers were facing the biggest test of all, America. And this is what the fuss is all about, the Bay City Rollers. Tam Payton orchestrated the kind of reception in New York that most bands could only dream of. The Bay City Rollers may soar here, or they may be gobbled up by Thanksgiving. Only your 14-year-old daughter knows for sure. The band went to number one in the US chart with the multi-million selling Saturday Night. They had broken America. You talk about the Osmonds, the Jackson 5, they were big, but nothing compared to the Rollers. America was just the start. Soon, Roller Mania would go global, and Peyton started seeking ways to keep the image fresh and young. He switched the group's oldest member, Alan, for the 16-year-old, Ian Mitchell. Peyton was pushing the band hard. We were on the road constantly. A typical day in a roller life, getting up in the morning in your hotel room, driven off to maybe a radio interview. Say hello to the rollers. There might be a photograph session, do a TV interview. Eventually, you get to do the show. Thousands of fans are screaming their heads off. And by the end of the day, you were knackered. The next day, the same again. Besides the stage tonight, right? So uh, we'll probably have to stop the show two or three times. Are you listening? He's listening. So I'm going to stop the show. Then. Tam ruled them with an iron rod. They couldn't do anything without Tam say so. On the road, Tam would make sure that there'd be two guys in each room. And you always share them with a different guy or Tam every night. Yes, do you want a drink? Uh, give me a notch. We were virtually prisoners in the hotel room. Tam would patrol the corridors, and you wouldn't have wanted to go out because you feared that you'd maybe get fired or Tam was going to give you a shouting. Listen to that out there. Can you get out of there? Go on, just get These days, if you had a band and the manager swapping rooms every night, there'd be a question asked very quickly. But in those days, it didn't occur to any of us.
The arrival of Ian Mitchell made clear the look that Peyton wanted. Youthful, fresh-faced boys, desperate for stardom. Say hello to Ian, who's new, new Hi. role. Hi, Ian. Why is he the right guy? Uh, well, you've always got to suss out the person first, you know? I think they've got to be very interested and, and really want to, to get on. Have He's they got to have a pretty face as well? Well, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> but within nine months, Ian Mitchell was burnt out. And Peyton brought in another wide-eyed new boy, Pat McGlynn. I'm going to meet him. Oh, hello, Pat, Mickey. how are you doing? How are you doing? It's great to meet nice you. Nice to see you. Yeah. Well, come through here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. You go. Okay. Yeah. That's brilliant. Can I bang right. my coat over here? Joining the rollers must have been mind-blowing. It was like going down the rabbit hole, to be honest, Alice in Wonderland. What did your parents say? Oh, they were really proud of me. My mum and dad, they thought it was great. My dad was a scrap dealer. I was quite a hard man. I was brought up in a council estate. When I was 13 or a 14 year old, I was in a gang. But then I got involved in music. It took me away from everything. You know, being in that band at 18 years old, you were living the dream. No, it wasn't a dream, because Tam Payton had total control on us. For me, it actually started the very first night I joined the Rollers. That night, I went out to his uh, house, told me, you're, you're in the Rollers now. You know, I was like, really, you know what I mean? And that's when he gave me this uh, poem, and told me it would make me feel better, and it'd prepare me for, like, tomorrow, because there was going to be a big sort of publicity date, pack the new Roller, and then, I took that and then sort of just crashed out on his couch. Woken up a bit, I don't know, an hour or two later, and uh, he was on top of me, molesting me. No. God. Were you actually raped? I'm afraid I was, yeah. Mm. Uh, I sort of got woken up uh, by Tam Payton. He could give me a, a set of basic road clothes, and I was still really quite Crazy. droggy and that. And then I was out in the back garden doing pictures and interviews non-stop. What was it like when you saw Tam? Was he kind of as if it hadn't happened? Ah, it was just no big deal. Well, it was just a bit of fun. Mm. I didn't know what to... I didn't even really understand what happened to me, to be honest. I was just getting my head around it. You were scared? Yeah. How many times did it happen? In Australia, another time he did it there as well. Same thing happened. Two or three months he'd been in the rollers, turned me into a drug addict, basically. Amphetamines and cocaine. I didn't really want to sleep in case uh, I woke up with tampering on top of me. Totally messed me up. Still, still, I'm still messed up with it. I'm still recovering from it. And I still get pissed off days. So, there's seldom days they get really depressed, but I, I sort of uh, soldier on, as they say. Mm. Only seven months after he joined the Bay City Rollers, Pat McGlynn was edged out. Years later, Pat did report Peyton to the police, but they said there was insufficient evidence to prosecute. I think it's important, you know, the abuse. I don't know about you, but in my experience, it's when you actually do talk about it to somebody, to people you trust, and get it out there, it's just better, isn't it? Well, it's good to find, speak to someone like yourself that does seem really genuinely interested and that understands and I feel you do believe what I'm telling you, so... Well, yeah, yeah, in the yeah. past, I don't think anyone's really believed me or understood me. I feel you have an understanding of what I'm talking about. Oh, good. Tam Payton was the monster. Back in the 70s, there were just people who thought they had the right to do what they wanted with you. In his last years with the band, Peyton increasingly withdrew to his hideaway on the edge of Edinburgh. 
he was now widening his net of abuse beyond wannabe pop stars and recruiting the most vulnerable from the fringes of the care system. I'm going to talk to someone now who lived in Little Kelliston with Tam Payton from when he was a young teenager and is still so traumatised by it all, he doesn't want to reveal his identity. How did you first become involved with Peyton? I was in a home. In a care home? Yeah. How old? 13. I was taking through his parties at Peyton's house. What were those parties like? The first couple of parties were OK. It was free drink and drugs and it was great. And then one night, there was a lot of people there. There was a couple of people I recognised for TV. I remember taking a drink and I thought, God, I feel really bad. Do you think you had spiked? A spiked tie. The next thing I can remember was being abused. It was three then. Tom was there, my trousers were down, and I was face down over the bed. And I just screamed out, I'm only 13, leave me alone. Carried on like it was. You carried on? Aye. Aye. It's disgusting. A few days later, I was told I needed to go out to Tom's. And he got me in the room and he said, I'll tell you right now, I've got photos of you doing things, enjoying it. You go to anybody, and these photos will go to your social worker and your family and that. It was frightening. And he told me, he says, you've got a lot of connections in the homes. I want you to bring boys here. Um, and you'll get left alone. And it's, just, it's, um, it's been there. Uh, the guiltiest thing in my life. How many boys do you think you took out there? 20, maybe, for different homes. And those boys were drugged and abused? And it would be, I. Just became normal because you just started thinking, well, I'm not getting touched. <laughs> I just used to hide in the room. So they left you alone? Most of the time. Not no. all of the time? Not all the time, no. Changed my life completely. Because it'll never go away. Did you feel that if you'd gone to the cops, they wouldn't have listened? They wouldn't have listened. There's you in the care system, my friends and, and myself. You were getting abused at a private school. No matter your background, you know? It's the same, aren't it? You were abused and it shouldn't have been happening. It's difficult to talk about, though, isn't it? Aye, but you need to do it. You can't keep it buried in your head all your life. We're all survivors, right? Eh? But not everyone survived. I found out how Tam Payton's shocking story affected the most famous roller of them all. I followed the troubled story of the Bay City Rollers through their heyday in the mid-1970s. Always front of stage was Les McEwen. You're like Sadie, all you beautiful fans over there. Go on, say word. The star of the show. An icon of that decade. <laughs> <laughs> but as the band's popularity waned, Les was falling apart, struggling with alcohol and drug addiction. Why wants to get into acting? Well, well, you know, I really think it's quite apparent who's going to be the actor, you know? <laughs> we'll see you later. <laughs> right, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Leslie, hey. goodbye. <laughs> After he was sacked from the band in 1978, he faced years of excess and loss 
until his death in 2021. I'm going to meet his widow, Pico, who lived with him for 40 years, and his son, Jubei. Nikki, you want a coffee or tea? Tea, please. Okay. Thanks very much. What a great pop star. That's there forever, isn't it? Yeah, forever. Even everybody grow up, get old, but still love him, you know, like a teenager, you know. I mean, there was a lot of struggles he had as well. Yeah. Did you know there was some deep sadness? He never tell me, but he suffering, sleeping, he's screaming. So he was screaming in the night? Yeah. Yeah, because when he would go on his binges, and sometimes he, uh, you know, he, he would say he, he hates himself. And, he, and uh, cry a lot. And that was often. Yes. That was like almost every time he started drinking. For years, Les had remained silent about the source of his troubles. It was only in 2009, in a television documentary, that he finally opened up. When I was in the BC Aurora, I was date raped. I kept that and balled up inside of me for years. So you were sexually abused? Yeah. I want to share that with uh, Peko and Jibri about it. I hope you understand that that's something that's happened in my past. He never told me about that. You found out during the rehab? Uh, yeah. You know how, how much love is there? That's all I know about. Yeah. That's all I agree about. In the month following the show's transmission, Les named Tam Payton as the man involved. Then he said to me, you know, I have a rape. I hate Tam Payton. Did Payton rape him? I think so. Mm. Mm. And then it kind of made sense. How do you mean, made sense? Well, you know, the, the drinking, the, you know, just the anger. You know, my, my, my dad's a broken man. He was a broken man. My dad didn't, never found peace in his life. You know, he never found peace. And um, that hurts. By the late 70s, Tam Payton was losing interest in the Rollers. And in 1979, the band fired him. Not long afterwards, he served 18 months in prison for gross indecency towards several underaged boys. Though he was never convicted of anything against the Rollers, once out of prison, he began a crime empire that would see him become an Edinburgh drug lord. The story of Peyton's long concealed abuse has brought back painful memories of my own from that time. Here you go. Oh, thanks. I thanks. Yeah, so, um, I just met Les's widow, and she said that Peyton raped him. Ugh. It had been bottled up all his life. And it kind of chimed, exploiting the vulnerable. Um, opportunistic, predatory behavior. You know, whether you're at a posh school or whether you're in a pop group and you want fame and you think, my God, this is amazing, this is everything I ever wanted. Um, you just accepted it because you had no choice and you didn't know any different. Mm. That era, it's very, like, step up a lip, be silent, get on with it, you know, so it's, there wouldn't have been that space. Mm. I think all the time about, why didn't we say anything? It's really, really difficult talking about it, but it's always with you. You feel ashamed, and I've got friends who would not want to go there. And I know it happened to them, because I saw it happening mm. to them. But to bring it into the open, to talk about it, is, in my life, part of the breaking free because I know the people who have spoken about it feel they at last are getting somewhere. Mm -hmm. And the number of people I've spoken to have been damaged, you know. Broken marriages, substance abuse, 
guys my age, because those are the, you know, those are the shadows that they see on the um, on the ceiling when they're lying in bed at three o'clock in the morning. It's that time in the changing room when he did that. You know. Mm. Yes, Tam Payton died in 2009. His last night was spent in his jacuzzi after an evening of drugs and sex with two boys. His life cast a shadow over the rollers. Do you have anything to say to your fans that we disappointed by this, Mr Longmuir? The band's drummer, Derek Longmuir, was sentenced to community service for possessing indecent images of children in 2000. Of the other members of the band, Ian Mitchell died in 2020, aged only 62. Alan Longmuir died in 2018. And Eric Faulkner is suffering from ill health and was unable to take part in this film. Can I have a little bit more of Woody, please? But Woody has continued to tour under the roller's name. One constant for me was music. Right now, it's great. I believe I've got a nice group of people that is now surrounding the Bay City Rollers. Ladies and gentlemen, now let's from please welcome the Bay City Rollers. Now the sun's seeing high in the sky And the love that's in everyone's eye Now the way to the end your story has always been so fascinating to me. You know, this extraordinary chapter in the history of, of pop music. You were part of the fabric of our lives when we were young teenagers. Yeah, I was just a lucky person that got caught up at the right time. I mean, how do you feel about all the other people who suffered? Terrible for them. Tom became this disgusting being. I had nothing to do with him after 79. So if the ghost of Tom Payton was walking down here, what would you say to him? I'd just go like that. <laughs> On you go. Away with you. No, I say it. Well, I, I hope reincarnation is around and hope he comes back and he can, you know, pay for some of the things that he did do. Do you think there's a danger that that tarnishes the band? It's just such a shame. They gave the band a bad name. But the past is the past. The band, the music, the whole thing, what I'm doing with it now is getting it clean and leaving a nice story because it, it should be that. I see it for what it was when it started, which was just a, a local band that made it massive. Shitty things happen. But these songs create happy memories too. The excitement was genuine and the stereo was genuine, and the joy was genuine. You can't take that away. <laughs> 